Thank everybody for coming out to tonight's event. I'm Dylan Fotiatis. I'm a fourth year student at the University of Toronto, and I'm also the president of the UTMIA here on campus. Uh, before we begin, though, I uh, wanted to mention that there are cameras in the room, just to keep that in mind as well. Uh, I do have to go through the six steps of the policy on the disruption of meetings here, just in case there, anything were to happen. Step one, uh, we will identify the disruptive persons and request that he, she, or they desist. Step two, we'll inform the instructors of the existence of the policy and the university's intent to protect free speech. Step three, if the disruption continues, those responsible should be asked to leave. Step four, if the disruption still continues, uh, we'll recess the event and we'll consider options to reconvene in, alternate, in an alternate space. Step five, uh, we'll take measures to ensure the event can be reconvened, reconvened without obstruction. And finally, step six, if interim measures are not sufficient, we will, assist, uh, we will consider assistance of external authorities. Also, uh, while I'm at it, I'd like to invite everybody to follow us on the internet tonight, online. So please, um, if, you have, uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can tweet them to at U of T using the hashtag men's issues, hashtag UTMIAS, or hashtag violence against men. I'm Denise Watman. I'll be moderating tonight's event on behalf of the University of Toronto Men's Issues Awareness Society, or UTMIAS. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight and for tonight's event on violence and sexual abuse against men. Our public talk tonight is on men's mental health with Lynn McDonald. If this is your first UTMIAS event, I'd like to welcome you and invite you to sign up for our emailed event updates with me or at reception just outside the front doors and to receive a schedule of our activities for this semester. Our goal at the UTMIAS is exploring gender equality, identity, and responsibility in society, particularly in areas of gender that are understudied in contemporary culture. This leads us to a current focus on the status, health, and well-being of boys and men, where attention, investment, and support for educational and social programs stands at a level that is far from ideal. The UTMIAS has the objective to explore the seriousness of this problem and to see what consequences may or may not arise for our society. This event tonight is sponsored by the Canadian Association for Equality, a charitable organization with a goal to provide up-to-date evidence-based research, education, and information um, through inclusive conversation and inter intersexual dialogue and a comprehensive discussion of the facts. No ideology or special interest agendas are promoted. One of their most recent projects is establishing the first Canadian Centre for Men and Families in Toronto. And I'll just introduce Justin Trotte to you now to also briefly talk about the Canadian Association for Equality, our sponsor tonight. <coughs> So thanks everybody for uh, coming out tonight, and thank you so much to Dylan and Denise and the U of T Men's Issues Awareness Society for hosting the event tonight. I'm very, very gratified to see all of you. Um, just a brief word from the sponsor, uh, Canadian Association for Equality. We've been around for about three years now. Uh, we are a registered educational charity, uh, the first in Canada with the dedicated goal of promoting awareness and educational opportunities related to uh, men's and boys' issues. So we're a very broad-based organization. We're interested in everything from men's health, uh, to fatherhood issues, uh, to issues to do with boys struggling in the school system. We've had events um, on a variety of campuses that we've sponsored, including ones here at U of T over the last couple of years that have touched on many of those areas. Um, as Denise uh, mentioned, we have just opened, it's pretty brand new in the last month in fact, uh, the first centre dedicated to all of those areas, and it's called the Canadian Centre for Men and Families. Um, we've had a couple of sort of more private events as we kind of get things started. Um, on November 16th will be our grand opening. So this will be something you won't want to miss. 
Uh, we will be announcing a variety of programs and campaigns at that grand opening event. Uh, there will also be music at the park across the street. Uh, there will be food. There will be um, some uh, uh, VIP types to help us sort of commemorate uh, the occasion. So I won't, I won't name names, but there's going to be some interesting folks that I think you're going to want to meet on the 16th of November. Um, let me also just recognize that this is uh, Mental Health Awareness Month at the University of Toronto during October uh, of 2014. And this event is part of that series. Um, we will also be doing another event on the 29th of October, which just got confirmed, so I can now announce it today. It will be in partnership with the Canadian Mental Health Association, the CMHA, on October 29th. Um, they will be bringing two of their facilitators in to talk about depression and suicide, in particular as it affects men. And as we know from the last few months, we've seen some rather uh, high-profile cases of uh, suicides of men. Uh, Robin Williams, of course, comes to mind. That that's, we know about that because he's a cele he was a celebrity, but of course, if you look at the statistics, suicide is something that does disproportionately affect uh, men, especially young men. So this is something that we're really going to um, prioritize in, in, in a couple of weeks, so I encourage you to come out for that. Um, we, I do want to sort of apologize about the security and the, the need to go through the disruption of meetings policy. It is kind of unfortunate when you talk about things like suicide or the sexual abuse of boys, apparently you need security. Apparently your posters get ripped down, your banners get vandalized. Uh, I'll leave that to you to reflect on what that might mean about our culture. Um, it is, I will have to observe, kind of ironic though that earlier today when we wanted to put up a poster or a banner actually specifically highlighting the silencing of this event, we had some trouble actually getting that banner approved to put up where we wanted it to go. Um, but ultimately, I should thank uh, the university for, uh, in this case, the arts and science faculty finally approving the banner, and, and I give them credit for that. Also give credit to the university administration at large. Uh, we have meetings with them routinely to talk about how to make these events successful. We are both, us, as stu the student group and the sponsor and the university, committed to uh, the free exchange of ideas. And sometimes that means hearing things that make you a little bit uncomfortable, some provocative ideas. The university gets that. They have a very strong free speech policy. We're very, very glad that um, they work cooperatively with us to make sure that these events can happen, finding us alternative rooms when we need them. That's why we moved into this much nicer auditorium. Um, and also providing us, free of charge in this case, uh, security access. So I think that shows that we're on the same page, committed to uh, the free exchange of ideas and also bringing attention on this, these marginalized areas of, of men's and boys' issues. So yes, thank you. We won't take up too much more of your time. I'll just alert you to, if you haven't seen uh, the tables outside, we've got th things for sale. All proceeds uh, do go to the Center for Men and Families and the educational programs, and you do get a tax receipt because we're a charity. Uh, you can sign up, that's free of charge. You can get emails from our organization. Uh, you can also volunteer. There are many ways to get uh, involved with, with what we do. Um, for example, we have a research project, and one of our volunteers who's actually been doing research in the area that Lynn will be talking about today on sexual exploitation of boys uh, has prepared an infographic, which is on the table, and I encourage you to grab that. And when he joins us a little bit later, he's commuting into a town, uh, he will say a brief few words about that uh, between Lynn's um, formal presentation and the Q&A, so in about an hour or so. So he'll be back up here to, to talk about that. Thanks so much for your attention, and I hope you enjoy tonight's event. Back to our organizer. Thank you, Justin. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if you So tonight, the U of T M I A S is pleased to have Lynn McDonald join us. She is a mental health practitioner, therapist, and men's support group leader. Lynn currently leads the group of Time for Men, and she's here to talk about violence and sexual abuse against men. She is also part of the winning team at MaleSurvivor.org. Please join me in welcoming Lynn McDonald to the University of Toronto tonight. Thank you very much. Um, 
Tonight, I am just an ask you to <laughs> Does that work? Yeah. <laughs> the guy put a microphone on me outside, and he asked me to talk in my normal voice. And then you guys are telling me to talk louder. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit, of, you know, quite a bit about male, male sexual abuse. Um, along with the OPP, um, for several years, uh, a, a small team of, of myself did a lot of conferences around the province. We did actually 25 conferences around the province um, called Understanding and Responding to Male Sexual Abuse. We were awarded the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for that work we did, so that was quite impressive. And we were awarded that medal, I think, because no one was talking, no one was raising awareness about men's issues and men's sexual abuse. I've been on the MaleSurvivor.org team for over 10 years now, and we do, um, we do um, weekends of recovery for male survivors of sexual abuse. How did that happen to me? Um, I started out working in the field of addictions. How do I go to the next one? Just, just. Okay. Now, how do I go to the next slide? I was working in the field of addictions and I worked there for 20 years. In doing that, um, I started to see that many people were doing really well. Many men and women were doing really well. And the center I worked at had a really high percentage of men compared to the women. So while I was doing that work, um, I, started to, I started to work with these, these people in aftercare, now continuing care. And then I was working with them longer term. And when I was working with them longer term, I started to understand that there were some issues. So who, who was, uh, what were the issues? Well, the issues invariably were, for most of these men, childhood sexual abuse. They couldn't recover from their addiction. So here I am working in an addiction treatment center, taking away their addiction, their, the medicine basically, and, um, and I'm not doing anything with the problem. I worked for a number, <coughs> number of years in a woman's treatment center for, for substance abuse. And in that treatment center, the same thing was coming up. That women that were having the hardest time recovering from their addiction were women that had abuse issues. But what happened there was there was a lot of places to send these women for treatment for their, for their um, abuse issues in this city. There was nowhere to send them in, that their brothers, their fathers, their lovers. Um, there was nowhere to send them in for their uh, abuse issues. So I started to decide that I was going to start looking into the men's issues. And that's just, that was just the progression of what happened to me, why I did what I did. So I already told you about me. I'm on the MaleSurvivor.org leadership team and have been for a while now, and I'm also on the inaugural team of a woman's weekend of recovery called Taking Back Ourselves. The prevalence, prevalence. approximately one in six boys is sexually abused before the age of 16. A conservative estimate of incidents. Uh, talking loud enough? No. Oh, shoot. Can you read lips? <laughs> okay, that better? Yes. Yeah, yeah. All the good stuff about me you missed. <laughs> okay, so um, approximately one in six boys is sexually abused before the age of 16. That's a conservative estimate. And I'll tell you why it's a conservative estimate. Because men and boys don't come forward. 
the statistics about college rape. I thought I'd look this up just because I'm here. It's not usually what I talk about. Since you started college, the questions were, since you started college or university, because this is a uh, U.S. thing, um, have you been sexually, has sexually inter sexual intercourse been forced upon you? And once, 5.3% of females, uh, more than once, 1.54. The interesting one is male responses, once, 3.17, and more than once, 0.96. Now, keeping in mind that people don't come forward, that's a very troubling statistic. Since you started college, the next question was, has someone, been, has, has someone had sexual intercourse with you that you did not want because you were drunk, passed out, asleep, drugged, or otherwise incapacitated? Female, 6.11, more than once, 1.56. Presumably, we learn. And male response is 3.72, and more than once, 1.31. One. Since you started college, has someone tried to force you? In the, in the, yes, they did, and blah, blah, blah. Okay. These are the stats for, for in Canada. Uh, men and women are sexually abused in 2008, 59% of the time residential, 48% of the men were. 48% of the men who were abused were abused within their homes, sexually abused within their homes. Commercial, that would be in a movie theater or whatever, 11%. Institution or college, women 6%, men 16%. Why is that happening here? Unknown 6 and 10. So the incidence of sexual assault is quite significant. And you know something, I don't think we're doing a lot about that. Several years ago I was asked about um, doing a, an in-service for the York University service um, security people. They couldn't find time or place for it. And that was when there was a lot of rapes going on at York University. And I'll show you a video at the end of this talk for a young man that went to York University and he was asking for help because he had been raped. And he, they said they couldn't help him because he was a man. They had no services for men at York University. This is not long ago. Myths about male victims of sexual assault. Here's the myth. A man cannot be raped. Real men can defend themselves against rape. Only gay men are victims and, and are perpetrators of rape. Men are not affected by rape, or at least not as much as women. A woman cannot sexually assault a man. Male rape only happens in prison. Sexual assault by someone of the same sex causes homosexuality, like you got raped and now you're going to be gay. Does that make sense? Homosexual and bisexual individuals deserve it because they're immoral and deviant. And if the victim physically responds to an assault, he must have wanted it. Now I want to talk about these things. Um, I, I run two groups for men called A Time for Men. Two separate groups, 10 in each group. In each group, two out of the 10 men were sexually assaulted by women. That's a high percentage considering women are not sexually assaulting men. Um, some of the men that I that are in my group are gay. They didn't ask for, for sexual assault, they didn't want it, and they aren't happy about it having happened to them. And it confuses them because they wonder, is that why I'm gay? Because I was sexually assaulted and that kind of way woke up my, uh, my sex drive? And it's very confusing for gay men who've been sexually assaulted. Um, a woman cannot sexually assault a man. Well, they can, and they do. And I'll remind you, two years ago, I believe, here in the city of Toronto, four women picked up a guy at a bar. He was 19 years old. This was a big joke. They picked up a guy at the bar, and they took him to a secluded place, and they, they assaulted, they sexually assaulted four women. Everybody thought it was so funny. This guy, this young man, 19 years old, was sexually assaulted by four women. The radios were making a big deal out of it. It was a big joke. Can you imagine if that had been a 19-year-old girl 
What would have been the response then if four men took her and sexually assaulted her? It wouldn't have been a joke. But that's what happened to this poor guy. He had the courage to come forward. Rape only happens in prison. Well, we just talked about it. It happens here on campus. Sexual assault by someone of the same sex causes homosexuality. Um, if there's any gay people in the audience, they obviously know that's not true. And if, it, if a victim responds to uh, sexual assault, he or she must have wanted it. Our bodies are designed to respond to stimulation. That's the way it goes. If I throw a can of pepper, black pepper, in the air, you are all going to sneeze. I'm going to sneeze too. Our bodies respond to stimulation. Men respond by getting an erection. Women respond by getting lubricated. That's the nature of, that's, that's how our bodies protect ourselves. That's the nature of it. It's just a, a result of the stimulation. But why don't men come forward? You know, if men would disclose and come forward, I kind of think we might have more services for men because the numbers are so small. They don't, people don't understand that there's a lot of men getting sexually assaulted out there. There's a cultural bias that says men's, males cannot be victims. Men are expected to be confident, knowledgeable, aggressive. To be victims means you're an inadequate male. It breeds shame. The men who have been sexually assaulted across the board feel ashamed. Even if they were sexually assaulted as children, they somehow feel they should have been able to do something about it. And when I point out to the guys that I work with that come to me, most of them come to me because they were sexually assaulted as children, when I point out to them, could your 7, 8, 10-year-old, 14-year-old son have stopped that from happening? <coughs> no. Well, why? Or who could you have told? They don't seem to have, you know, they do, there are no answers. Who could you have told? Well, if I was sexually assaulted by the priest, uh, came home and said that, I'm going to get my mouth washed out with soap. I had one Muslim man come to see me who had been sexually assaulted by, a, by his, his spiritual leader, and his father beat him up when he told, when he told his father. You should not have let that happen to you. He was a child. If the boy's body has responded sexually, he feels that somehow he was responsible for the sexual abuse. Somehow he was complicit. Male victims struggle with issues of homosexuality. As most offenders are male, true, not all, please remember, but most. Their homophobia kicks in, and their, plus their confusion and their fear, and that encourages silence. Not to mention the social stigma attached to homosexuality, which thank, thank whoever, um, here in Toronto, that's going away, finally. If a boy receives money for sex, he is less likely to be perceived as a victim. Well, you know, people who groom children, they give them money. They give them all kinds of things. So these children, they don't understand what's going on. I have one man I'm working with currently, and he was a, a child prostitute. Would he have been a victim of sexual assault? What do you think? He's a child prostitute. Many of you who are old like me will remember uh, the shoeshine boy who was murdered. He was a child prostitute as well. This, this guy worked with that shoeshine boy. If a boy has, sexual, has a homosexual orientation, he's often blamed for the seduction of older <coughs> males instead of acknowledging a legitimate victim of sex, as a legitimate victim of sexual abuse, as if. Molestation by an older female often is viewed positively as a kind of initiation into manhood. You know, I notice in the newspaper that when a woman has sexually, got become sexually involved with a 16, like a 29, 30-year-old teacher, becomes sexually involved with a six, 15, 16 year old boy, it's called a relationship. A relation, if it was a 30 year old man and a 16 year old girl, would that be called a relationship? I don't think so. That, that's not a relationship. There's, the power dynamics is so wrong. 
Males more than females may feel a loss of freedom and independence of the sexual if the sexual abuse is made public. Actually, so many men that have come forward with sexual saying they have been sexually abused, they don't get they don't get believed. They do not get believed. They are told that it couldn't happen. They're told go away. They're told we don't know how to deal with this. It's 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 changing. It's really changing, but it's not changing fast enough. There's fear of reprisals from the offend from the offender, and that plays a role in the reporting. So you know, I I have an article in here that um, the guy said if I reported, she's gonna she has threatened me. If I reported, she's gonna say I raped her. So these guys, you know, they can't come forward. It's it's insane. Um, when boys are victimized, they tend to be blamed more for their the abuse and are viewed as less in need of care and support. The shame involved with being a male victim of sexual abuse is incredible. It takes years of therapy to get over. The shame, the self-blame, I should have known better, I should have done something, I should have fought him off, I should have, I should have, I should have. The shame and the self-blame is incredible and it's the saddest thing. It's soul destroying. Obviously the, the boy feels negative, negative judgment by families and friends and embarrassment and other confusion prevents males from disclosing. <coughs> when I when men come to me, by the time they come to me, they have difficult they have had difficulty form, forming into personal relationships. They have maybe have been married for years, but they're not good at in that they're not good at that relationship. They go they make money, they bring it home, but there's a distance. There's not a deep relationship. They have difficulty understanding people, and that's basically because they don't trust what people are saying. There's, it's hard to trust somebody when the person, a person in authority or a person you thought was your friend or the person you thought liked you took advantage of you and raped you. There's always the blaming, self-blaming, the depression, and the seesaw mood swings. This is kind of interesting to me. These mood swings often are misdiagnosed as bipolar. So I don't know how many people I've seen that have said, oh, I'm diagnosed as bipolar. They used to call it manic depressive. They're not. They're having mood swings because they were sexually abused and they, they're, they're not, they don't know how to live in this world. Lasting effects, anger, fear, homosexuality issues, helplessness, isolation, alienation, legitimacy, loss, masculine issues, negative childhood peer relations. Negative schemas about people, negative schemas about self, problems with sexuality, self blame, guilt, shame, and humiliation. That is that's an incredible list, isn't it? Who do you know that that would apply to? Everybody in here knows someone who has been sexually assaulted and they're not there they know, they suspect, but they don't they don't <coughs> talk about it. Everybody every, one in you know, one in six, one, two, three, four, five, six. You, one, two, three, four, five, six. You, one, two, three, you know, look around. That's the way it goes. So this all results in anxiety, depression, dissociation, hostility, anger, <coughs> on and on. Impaired relationships, suicide ideation, suicide behaviors. Um, the suicide chair at St. Mike's often refers people to me because they've gone there because they attempted suicide or tried to attempt suicide or went there because they were feeling suicidal. And once she kind of digs a little bit, she finds out, you know, the, the real reason was that they had been sexually abused and they don't know how to live with that. They don't know how to cope with that. They worked hard, they got through college, they did everything they should have done, they're still miserable and unhappy. Strategies. This is strategies how they ineffectively try to cope. There's emotional effects, minimizing, they minimize, they start rationalizing, they go into a denial. This couldn't have happened to me because I'm, you know, or it didn't matter, right? Because that was long ago. And if they go to a, a mental health professional or a doctor, the doctor will say, you know what? That happened so long ago. Why don't you just get over it? Get on with your life. Forget about it. <coughs> they would if they could. The 
fact is they can forget about it. That's the big problem. Problems with boundaries, um, dissociation, DID, MPD, and multiplicity, problems with boundaries, trusting others, relationship with one's bodies and <coughs> behaviors. Can you imagine not wanting to touch your own body? Can you imagine what that would be like? So what ends up happening is I'm bad, no one loves me, no one could love me, I'm unlovable, I'm dirty, it's my fault, I'm stupid, I should have done something, I should have told someone. I should have told someone because that person kept going and abused more and more people. That's why I should have told someone. So they feel responsible for any other victim that comes forward, ever, or who might come forward, or who suicided. I hate myself, I must have been bad, I must have wanted it, I must have done something, I'm being punished. Um, this is an interesting one, I'm being punished. One of the men I've been working with for three or four years now, he lost his son. His son was born um, premature and his son died. He really felt that he was getting punished for what happened to him. But somehow it was his fault that he was sexually abused and somehow that was, he was getting punished for that. I have two men in my group who are actually, they came to see me because they felt they were being punished because they lost children to death. It's so irrational, but it was so, it was so meaningful for them. That's why it happened because I don't deserve to have a child. I don't want to be me. I deserve to die. Why did these things happen to me? I must have deserved it. <clears throat> but the assumptions people make, you know, that's what keeps them silent. This keeps all the men silent. People are really too quick to assume that a person who has been accused of sexual abuse is guilty, even when there's no supporting evidence. Do you know what? When you, if somebody accuses someone else of sexual abuse, they don't really use an audience. They usually do it all by themselves. So you would go and say, I was sexually abused, and they say, uh, it's his, your word against his. His word against his. There's no evidence. But the fact is, when a disclosure of sexual abuse is made, it's more common for the person who has been abused to be challenged about their assertions than the person who has been accused. So you go in there and disclose you were sexually abused and the cops, the police officers, <coughs> are going to challenge you about that. Tell me the details, tell me what happened, what did you do about it, what were you, what did you, did you have, how much did you drink, how much did you, you know, they're challenging the victim. And it's probably, I shouldn't be surprised about that. You know, somebody stole my car. I called them, hello, somebody stole my car. And the person on the other end of the phone says, did you leave your keys in it? So what if I did? They're not supposed to take my car. But I didn't leave my keys in it. But you know what I'm saying? You don't blame the victim, but people do. And especially when it comes to sexual abuse. Why were you in that place? Why did you walk down that dark alley? Why were you out so late? Why did you let that person into your place? If you think, you should have known better. You should, you know that. All that stuff. It just makes me crazy. Few boys are sexually abused. Actually, that's so not true. Depending upon the definition used in the approach to data collection, 6 to 15 percent of adult men report a history of childhood sexual abuse. And now the stats are coming in. Now people are coming forward. And it's higher. And it's interesting to me. I kind of wonder, I sneakily wonder, could men be more abused, men and boys, especially boys, be more abused than little girls. Most of the women that come to me later um, who had been abused in childhood were abused kind of within the home, an aunt or uncle, a grandpa, a big brother. Um, they were abused within a family context usually. The boys I see, the men that I see that were abused as boys, it, it's the uh, perpetrators have a lot more access to boys. The coach, the priest, the altar boys, the, uh, the <coughs> teacher. They, like they, they often have a bigger market to pull from if you want. So I have wondered 
if men and boys are getting more sexual abuse because they don't come forward. We don't know. Uh, females don't sexually abuse children. I already told you that they do. Um, women don't like to hear this. I hate it to hear it. I hate it. I hate when somebody talks to me about their mother sexually abusing them. Some man talks to me about that. I, it feels so awful to me. Women are not supposed. Women are supposed to be the nurturers, and I, I have to tell you, I don't like to hear that at all. It's it's it, it blows my mind. But the fact is, it's true. It happens a lot. It happens a lot more than one would suspect. In Canada, 90 to 95 percent of people who reported to, to who are reported to children's services for sexual abuse were males. However, that means 10, 5 to 10 percent were women. Most of the family members were who abused within their role as caretakers. They were babysitters, teachers, or daycare workers. Seven percent of sexual abuse children's services investigation involved mothers as the alleged perpetrators. Five percent biological mothers, two percent stepmothers. There's no difference in the severity of abuse by a female sex offender as compared to the male sex offender. No difference. It's abuse is abuse. It's awful. I don't know about you, but that just makes me feel. I hate the fact that fathers sexually abuse. I also hate the fact that mothers sexual abuse. Maybe because I'm a woman, I find it even harder to swallow. So how do people cope? Well, as I told you, when I first started working, I was working in the field of addictions. That's when I discovered that so many people were getting sexually abused, so many men. Um, they turned to prostitution because actually, after all, that's what they're working. Boys and girls, men and women, turn to prostitution. They become isolated. They start having frequent sexual activities because at, that's what they learn. That's what they know how to do. That's, that's what it's all about. Or they, they can become sexually anorexic, no sex. They avoid sex with a passion. Or they overwork, or they don't work. They can't work at all. They can't keep it together. Often they're high functioning, and they're just as often they're low functioning. Anger is a big issue, such a big issue. Argumentative, and then some avoid conflict. Perfectionist and wanting to please others. I think the wanting to please others is one of the across the board traits. The perfectionist is so comical. And OCD. My office is t not tidy. You know, it's got stuff here, and I've been given things and from different clients over the years. And they will, <coughs> guys will come in and they will start doing this. And then they'll move my glass thing here. And they'll just make it all nice and tiny. And if you understand what's going on there, when your your life is so disjointed and so confusing, you want things around you to be and can you get in on time and in place. Um, how do you do that? The cultural bias maintains that males cannot be victims, males are expected to become much oh, hating myself here. So already I'm almost done. I wonder how I can play this. Does anybody know how to this? Was, this was the young man. When I met him, he was 19 years old. He had been sexually abused. And this is his story. Now, he came into my office, and he he came, he went through a 12 week program, said, I'm cured. Went to a 12 week program, I'm cured. Went to a 12 week program, I'm cured. And then he came to me one on one. So we started working. And then he came into my time for anger. And for a year, he sat there looking at the floor. It's on there. <coughs> so he came looking at the floor. For about a year, he sat there just cursing and swearing and saying, I can't believe this. I can't believe I have to learn to smile. I can't believe I have to learn to be friendly. I can't believe I have to learn da 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 <coughs> I just could not believe it. And then one day he came in and he 
was smiling. What happened? He said, I was walking down the street and I just looked up. So I hope you play this video. This is his story. He's a, he's a, He's a award-winning filmmaker today. Uh, and I wanted to show you his film so badly. Where's the, where's the techie people in here? Oh. It's on my PC I was sexually abused from the age of two and a half. Trump the volume. People do uh, live here. But walk around with lift. Let's see what happens. Sorry, would you mind just turning the volume up just a little bit, like the maximizing stuff at the bottom? One of six boys, four to the age of six years, has a childhood history of sexual abuse. I think a lot of people have tried to tell their stories from a place of darkness. And I think now we're starting to get to a place where people need to know, it, you know, people can heal from this. Everything we do is about bringing the message of hope, healing, and support to male survivors of sexual abuse, to their loved ones, and to our partners in healing. And by that I mean therapists, the social workers, all the people that we work with. A large part of what happens by men coming together for a three-day retreat setting is they break the isolation, they realize there are other people who have been in similar situations, they get to tell their story with each other, and out of that, there's a whole sense of community that begins to emerge. And that's largely what Male Survivor has been, is a volunteer community-driven organization. Male Survivor has that understanding of providing a safe environment. It monitors when, when you're online, it monitors when you're doing any kind of recovery, it has skilled facilitators, and it provides that safe environment. And what it does is it promotes a positive approach to the healing process. Bell Survivor, in my mind, is an amazing organization. This is a grassroots organization. It is made up of the people who have been victimized and the people who help those who are victimized. They're actually helping kids, they're helping adults who survive the victimization of children. They're educating the world on how to prevent this from happening. This is an epidemic that we need to be paying attention to as a society. We all have the ability to do something to help. When we're working together to bring healing into the lives of those who've been shattered, we're going to beat abuse. I'm involved with, male survivor. Um, Jim Clemente, you saw there, he, he was the uh, FBI advisor for criminal lives, just a little, little information there. And, but I really wish I could show you Jordan's. We can't get it up. Excuse me, is the video that you want to show is on the internet? No. No, it's at the presentation. You should just hit enable content. Get Enable content on the PowerPoint. Okay, do you want to come here and do that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> really appreciate that. Oh, there we go. Oh, there. Yeah, you see button. that button right there? Yeah, click that. Yeah, hit that. And now, love the presentation. Now, love the presentation. Hit the current slide. Up at the top. Current slide. Yeah, top button. Uh oh, you want to that back? Sorry, it's too small to read.
a final thought, while it may be tempting to focus on how awful it is to be abused, it's really important to not lose sight of the reality that survivors are full human beings with many gifts and talents to offer the world. Some of the most creative, sensitive, intuitive, deep, profound, and hopeful people I've known are incest and child sexual abuse survivors. They were able to be that way not by losing the touch of their humanity, their soulfulness, in the face of others' inhumanity. We can all learn a great deal from survivors. <coughs> survivors of childhood sexual abuse and survivors of adult sexual abuse. Thank you. survivors, childhood or otherwise, they have invasive thoughts, invasive uh, memories, and can't sleep, or, you know, can't, are comfortable in crowds, or whatever. So they use substance abuse to cope, to numb out their feelings. They don't want to feel that anxiety all the time. They don't want to, you know? So I think that's what's going on there. The sad downside of that is um, the emotions get magnified. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Okay. Are you familiar with the case of Martin Cruz very, and uh, very, Gordon Stoplet? Very, very, very familiar. I've worked with the Cruz family. Teresa Cruz has uh, actually, the, who funds my groups, is the uh, Maple Leafs Gardens Fund, and it's the Martin Cruz Memorial Fund. And Martin Cruz's father gave me all his addiction books, all his treatment books that he was trying to use to recover. And I passed them out to other men who were in the same boat. So I know Teresa, the sister-in-law who's done the film, Martin's story, uh, very well, and his brother and the whole family, yeah. And she has often, they have often said to me, if my group was going now, Martin would be alive to me. Yeah. yeah, he committed suicide. He jumped off the lure of Lyra. Uh, in your talk, you mentioned uh, when a victim of sexual abuse is being uh, interviewed or rather questioned by the police, you, you brought a victim blamable, but I'm just wondering, could an argument be made that when a police officer or let's say a lawyer in a courtroom, is that really victim blaming if they're asking, well, how did it happen, when did it happen? Because to me, that's just them getting the facts and making sure the story is airtight. I mean, isn't victim blaming being, I just think that's a bit harsh. They're not blaming what happened, they just want to be sure that what you're telling me is totally and absolutely true and that you're not making it up. It's an absolutely wonderful point. They have to make sure they have all the facts so they can put together a good crew, a good case. However, it depends on the sensitivity of the officer or the or the defense lawyer, if you want. They that person can try to that I've been on the stand so many times. They try to the defense lawyer tries to trick you and make you look stupid and stuff like that. But if, if the officer has been trained in, in, sexual, in the sexual assault team and has been trained, then that person is often very sensitive and will ask the questions in a way to get the information without making the, uh, the victim be shamed or blamed. Yes, okay. Yeah, that, it's absolutely a good question. Thank you. Any further questions, Dan? Um, yeah, thanks for your thanks. talk. Um, I'm kind of wondering if uh, the fact that, uh, as you noted, that in the paper we see that uh, uh, the, two, the, the two different scenarios, if it's a male teacher and a female student that beast raped him, sort of deal, and uh, if the sexes are reversed, she seduced him, I'm kind of wondering if that's playing in on uh, the rate of reporting. <sighs> I, I 
suppose, I suspect, I don't have any data to, to support that, but I would suspect because you, you've seen it many times, uh, you know, it's not news to me, I'm not giving you news, um, that if it's a young man and a female teacher, um, it's not statutory rape, it's a relationship. If it's the opposite, if it's a male teacher and a young woman, it's statutory rape, it's not a relationship. So I see it that way. I, I think, too, the fact that if it was a teacher and everybody's going, he, he goes to his friends, he says, you know, Miss So-and-so brought me to her house and she uh, did stuff to me and all of his friends go, wow, lucky you. So how does he come forward and say, you know, I'm not so lucky. That didn't, that wasn't a good experience for me. Because all his buddies are going to say, if he does that, they're going to say, what, what, are you crazy? What, are you gay? Are you fag? You know, they're, going to, they're really going to be hard on him. So, you know, he can't, in his peer group, he can't get support. And interesting, the girl, she would go to her friends, and, and her friends would say, that's not okay. You've got to go to tell somebody about this. So, I think that would keep a man, a boy, an adolescent boy silent. Wouldn't... I don't know, would it, would it keep you silent? Yes, you saw. I'm curious about uh, some of the symptoms you mentioned as uh, the effects of uh, sexual abuse. Um, in particular, you talked uh, in, in response to the question about addiction. Um, I, I wonder, would, would the flashbacks be a sort of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder? Or, um, but you also mentioned that um, the mood swings are more of an effect than an actual bipolar. So, um, from a like, your therapist perspective, right? How do you distinct these, and are the treatments any different? Um, no. <laughs> Short answer: No. The treatment is not different. The um, the PTSD is um, is the correct diagnosis for flashbacks and inability to sleep. There, you know, there's the criteria for PTSD, and if you meet that criteria, it's PTSD. Um, bipolar, it's, you can be diagnosed with bipolar disorder by the virtue of the fact that you have mood swings, but bipolar disorder is a lot more extreme than mood swings. You know, you, you, you read in the paper, or you, you probably have heard about people going off on spending, Probably you mostly hear about it with famous people. They go, Charlie, Charlie Sheen, really off the wall, blah blah blah, way up in the air, all kinds of crazy things, and then crashed. You know that would be a, him and um, who was that? She used to be super. Woman. Another actress, anyway. Linda Evans. Pardon? Linda Evans, super. Yeah, I think I think she went into a, a bipolar thing. I met people with bipolar a teacher who went and took her whole class to say see Les Mis, you know. That's the manic stage. That's and then she can't go to work for months because she can't get out of bed, she's so depressed. Or she ends up in the hospital. Those manic bipolar, manic depression is way more serious and way more the movements are huge. Um, consequently, bipolar when you get diagnosed with bipolar as a result of the, the uh, trauma they experience, the mood swings, they're in this range rather than in this range. You know, like, okay, does that answer your question? Um, I was wondering, what, what, I wonder more about the flashbacks and stuff. Are they usually as severe as uh, PTSD or, or again, it's like a narrower range? The flashbacks, someone who's suffering flashbacks, um, the flashbacks are PTSD, they are oh. part of PTSD. Um, you think of PTSD with Vietnam War vets or someone like that. But if you are laying in your bed at night and you start having a flashback and you reach over and you grab uh, your partner's hair and start banging, banging, or banging it against the headboard, that's a serious flashback. That's you know, that's post-traumatic stress disorder. You're not hearing the bombs blow off, but you're feeling what happened to you, and you're frightened and you're trying to fight. That's a flashback, and that's PTSD. Um, I, have, I have seen people who have PTSD flashbacks, and they they were anally raped, and they are they bleed, they physically bleed, or they'll develop hemorrhoids, and they 
it's a flashback, yes, it's a flashback. Nothing is happening to them. There's no physiological reason for that to happen, but it happens. So PTSD, you know, really. Yes? Uh, just a question to clarify. How is sexual abuse defined in the literature? So you mentioned there are different statistics based on the way it's defined. How do you see it defined? I can't quite hear you. Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, just how sexual abuse is defined against men. So you mentioned in one of your slides, statistics are different depending on the way it's defined. Clarify what you see. Well, sexual abuse is any unwanted sexual touch, bottom line. That's it. But who's doing this, who's taking the, in, the information via the survey, they may not de define it that way. So that's why it said it that way, because it de depends who's, who's collecting the data. But any unwanted sexual touches, touch, sexual touches, sexual abuse, <coughs> is bottom line. Um, how would you classify um, when a boy, uh, when their family member gets sexually abused, it could be a sister or someone, now that's going to have an effect on the boy too, and it could be quite devastating. So, yes. Now that, so although that person didn't have direct sexual abuse, but that, the effects of it could be yeah. just as bad. So Absolutely. how would that be classified? It's an area that I don't even think is being discussed. Well, that's a good point because Sexual abuse, if, if you have, so it's any unwanted sexual touch, okay? But if you have witnessed sexual abuse, you will be traumatized as if it happened to you. Survivors get yes. basically. Oh yeah, you will have the same kind of trauma. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're a young boy and you're, you, you hear your sister or your brother or your mother being raped, you even hear it, you don't even see it. Sure, you're gonna you're gonna be traumatized by that. Right. So it's it's just an area that doesn't seem to be totally ignored. Right. It's totally ignored unless you go to see a therapist, yeah. and then it's not ignored. <coughs> That's bottom line. Then I wanted to ask a question about the uh, social construction of, of what happened, of, of the events that happened, and how. And how, if you, if you have any evidence that the, the people that you work with are affected by the way that uh, abuse, sexual abuse is currently conceived of, and I'm thinking back to, for example, the age of consent for sex at one point of turning when the girls was 12 years old. So obviously, right now, we would be horrified by the idea of a 12-year-old girl being involved in, in, a, in a sexual relationship. Back then, it was not horrifying. For example, do, do you see any evidence that your clients, for example, if they've been sexually, their, their perpetrator was a man, if it is sometimes harder for them because of all of the social construction about whether they are a person, they are a perpetrator, they should have done something. Whereas, for example, if it's a woman, they may not necessarily feel inherently this was acceptable, but they don't carry the extra shame of uh, uh, being laden with this idea that they should have rejected this, this sort of gay panic kind of idea. So I, I wonder, to, to that extent, the way that our society currently understands our current social mores kind of feed into how, um, what the experience is like for the, the survivors. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a huge, it has a huge it keeps me inside, basically. Um, I'd just like to uh, ask your thoughts about um, across all age groups, <clears throat> men in Canada make up 76% of the suicide population. At the 20 year, year old age group, they make up 80%. Now, uh, you had touched upon earlier how does you know a, a young man, perhaps an adolescent, come forward and say, you know, I was abused. Um, do you feel that uh, that could be a contributing factor at that higher suicide rate at that lower age group? I, it could be, but I have no data to hang my hat on that. I feel like it, it could be and very likely is, but I don't have the data to say yes. So would, you, so would it be safe to say that 
the Canadian government needs to get on the ball and start researching well, these things? Thanks for mentioning the Canadian government. Uh, three, maybe three years ago, four years ago, the Canadian, the Ontario government gave um, service providers in Ontario, um, they put out $20 million to bring up the uh, level of services for male sexual abuse uh, victims. And um, they gave that money to, proposedly gave that money to people who were um, treating men. But all of the money went to pe people who weren't treating men. Um, and if you worked it out, the money they gave would be about 73 cents a man. That's what we worked at. Now people like me, um, and people like the Gatehouse, and people, other, other agencies that were treating men, we didn't get a nickel. Um, but the upside of that is, I, I sat corrected with that, because <coughs> these agencies that did get the money developed programs for men. So that was a, that was one of the smarter things the government did. They said, okay, we're going to give you this money, but you have to develop programs for male survivors. And they have. So that was really, in the end, a good thing. But it was supposed to go to people who were already doing the work. Um, I'd just like to expand upon that. Um, so were the organizations that uh, did receive money, were they accepting of shall we say, forced development as being a sexual assault, or were they kind of reluctant to admit that? No, they actually embraced it. They really embraced it. They have people like me come in and do in-service training. Um, yeah, we had, I, I did a couple of uh, weekends for recovery up in the northern region. They got money. They really, the ones, the ones that I know about, they really embraced it. They really understood that they weren't serving the population as they should. It was really, uh, I, I was really delighted to see how they responded to that. Yes? Do you think uh, everyone who has experienced uh, sexual assault as a child develops uh, sorry, serious mental problems? No. Would you, what would you, your guess, do you have any guess as to what percent it's okay. If, if, if a, a child receives, has been sexually assaulted and they come from a loving home, a supportive home, and they go home and the parent starts noticing, like, you're acting strange. What happened? Come on, talk to me, Johnny. What's, what's going on? You, you don't seem to want to do this anymore. And you're, uh, you're not wanting to play with your friends anymore. And then that child talks about, they feel safe enough to talk about what happened to them. That child will get help right away. They'll get support right away. They won't get blamed or shamed, and that child will not have long-term effects as a rule, usually. But the ones that have long-term effects, they're coming from an environment that's not supportive. For one reason or another, there may be another sick child in the family, so all the attention is going to that child. There may be a hard-working single mom. There may be a lot of reasons, but. The ones that don't have any long-term effects are the ones that get supported, validated, and and help right away. So they don't, get, they don't end up shamed and blamed. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So just to clarify again, so you would say like, because I mean, not that many people get treatment. Right? So you would say like six to fifteen percent of men probably live with long-term mental health consequences of abuse without knowing it. Without knowing it, I'll go even further to say that we could close half of the prisons if we could treat sexual assault in men early. Mm -hmm. The money we're spending on prisons makes me want to vomit because that 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 money should be. Those guys are in there for substance abuse. They're in there for theft. They're in there for because they're trying to subs. You know, for, they have a sense of entitlement for what was done to them. They're angry. They have the rage of holics. Uh, on and on it goes. Like I, I think we could close half the prisons if we could treat men early. First time they go into jail, that's it. They get treated. Yeah. Is that it? Are you familiar with the publication The Invisible Boy from 1996? I know that publication. Yes. It's available on the King Children's Rights Council website, and uh, tens of thousands of people have downloaded. Yeah. It's available if you, I, I gave Justin some way to contact to get some government publications, that's one of them. And that was published by Health Canada. Yeah, and Health Canada has published a lot of publications. 
Um, it's easy to get, but you have to you have to look for them. You have to just be those. So our tax dollars at work, I like to say. And there's also the CTV documentary when uh, girls do it, an examination of female sexual predators, which you can watch over the internet as well on the Canadian Children's Rights Council website. Yeah. There's lots of good stuff available now, way better than it used to be. Why I'm kind of excited about this, this Center for Men and Violence, because so many men have such a hard time finding services. But if this center does the job right, they will have access, they will be able to let, them, let people know where services are available. And that's kind of why I agreed to come here. <coughs> Well, one of your slides with the uh, symptoms, which you went over pretty quickly, one of the bullet, bullet points uh, you mentioned, multiplicity and uh, dis disassociation and some other acronyms, but you didn't really go into it. Could you maybe explain what some of those? Uh, multiplicity. It used to be called multiple personality disorder. Multiplicity. Um, that's an inaccurate term, but most people know it that way. Um, D DID is the more modern term, dissociative identity disorder. So if you have been, and, and it happens more often when somebody has been tortured, tortured by the sexual abuse. They will split off and they will develop other personalities to cope with what's going on. So part of their personality doesn't have any memory of what happened. The other part of the personality holds all of the pain. And usually the other parts of the person, three, three, four, maybe five, the, the part of the personality that holds all the pain, the other parts of the personality hate that part. Yeah, I hate that part. So someone like me is trying to get them to understand why they have all pain. But, yeah. So if you have experienced a really se severe uh, sexual abuse that involved some level of torture, that can happen. And it happens like three, four, five-year-old child who's tied to a bed, anally raped um, many times. So they hear the steps coming up, some of the footsteps going up, they're thinking of one particular case, steps coming up the stairs, knowing this is going to happen again. Uh, that's torture. Of course, there's lots of more serious tortures, but this particular case, that was the torture that person experienced and developed the idea. Mm -hmm. Um, male and female victims and male and female victims. I'm not even sure that it does. <laughs> um, grooming is when someone befriends a child and um, the, 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 the predator, I, I, there's a really neat book that, that the FBI published on, um, on non-familiar non abusers and the predator has the time and the energy to spend a lot of time with that child. So it might be uh, Mr. Jones down the street or Miss Harvey or whatever. And they spend time with that child and they give that child attention. And they may, the child may come from a big family, they may buy them extra special things because the family can't afford it. They may take them to movies. And actually the family is so delighted <coughs> that this person is spending time with their child that they encourage it. So the, the predator actually grooms the parents as well as the child. And I don't think there's much difference, I don't know off the top of my head much difference between the men and the little boys and the little girls. Um, but that's essentially the way it goes. The child um, is getting extra special attention. The parents are thinking this is a good thing. Um, you know. We don't have time to go money or whatever to do that with our child, so good, good for us that we kind of got a god godparent for that kid. And you know, they encourage it. Now when the sexual abuse starts and the kid doesn't want to go anymore, the parents are saying, you know, so and so is so kind to you, you know, you're hurting his feelings, you're hurting her feelings. So they don't even let the child, they, they don't understand why the child is not happy anymore doing this. So that's how the grooming goes. It's, it, uh, any variation on that. Um, priests saying, oh, your, your, your son is special, 
you know, he, he's, he's marked by God. He's going to make a great priest. I want him to be an altar boy. You know, I'm going to spend time with him. I'm going to, and the parents, good Catholic people, or good Catholic, whatever the, the, the uh, persuasion is, they're like, oh my gosh, isn't this wonderful? My, my child is getting all this special mentoring. cost of all this to the taxpayer of this country? The, the cost of all this treatment and everything else that... I, I think the better question is what, are the, what is the cost of no treatment? And I'll tell you what the cost of that is. Broken families, suicide, hospital visits that you shouldn't have to have, jails, um, that's the cost of no treatment, and that's high. Very high. The better question is, what is the cost of no treatment? Okay, thank you. Just you just got my back up. <laughs> yeah. Um, kind of along the same uh, lines, but not like just kind of. Along. Um, what do you feel, uh, what do you believe the effect of fathers being afraid to be uh, positive? involved in their child's life for fear of an allegation of sexual abuse. That, that is so, so sad. I've met so many dads and grandfathers that are terrified to be affectionate, physically affectionate, give them hugs and kisses and sit them on the lap, because they're terrified that something's going to snap in them and they're going to become predators. They, they feel like they bought that, bought that myth that if you've been sexually abused, you will sexually abuse. And that is such a myth. So the cost is they keep the kid at arm's length. Because they're terrified that they're it's not so much they're afraid of being accused of it. Is that, I know that's your question. Uh, I just meant more along the general population. Not you, but it, uh, you know, also inclusive of those who have been uh, victims as well. Yeah. Well you know, if, if a father can't be a father to a, a child, can't, can't be a good father, can't spend time with the child because they're afraid that, um, I, I, I don't see them, like, the question is not a good question because I don't see them being afraid of being accused. I see them more being afraid of having a switch turn on and then all of a sudden they'll find their kid attract, sexually attractive. I don't see them being afraid of being accused. But you know, it, bear bear in mind that some in some separation, that that allegation has come forward. Absolutely, Eric Pitsy has called it the silver bullet in a, in a divorce proceeding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that has come forward, but on a personal level for the man, I don't I don't see that. I see he's more afraid that he's going to wake up to the fact that he's sexually attracted to his child, and that's that that's not going to happen. Sexual attraction towards children starts when you're when your sexual attraction starts when you're like 12, 15, 14, whatever. So it's not going to start when you're 40 or 35. The reason why I ask that question is because uh, geez, I think it was about two years ago, a man was asked to move out of an airplane seat where there was two children. Uh, and it was absolutely you know, heinous and ridiculous because they were afraid that, he, you know, just the, the stewardesses in the airline were afraid that this gentleman was going to attack the children in a sexual way. Why? Prejudice, society prejudices against men? I've never heard that before, and I, and I, I, I actually... I can look up the article if you like. I, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's the norm. Let's put it that way. I, I hope it's not the norm. I pray it's not the norm. So I, I think to differ. It actually is in, 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 in certain countries. countries. Yeah, there's been legal countries. cases in Australia. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Oh, that's, that is so true. sad. So very yeah. sad. That was the point I was going to bring up. There was actually the mayor of London was questioned when he was sitting beside his own children. And he was asked to move, and it was his own children. They were like, why are you moving him? He's our father. And then he pointed it when they were like, oh, he's your father. And that's when it clicked that they thought he was going to be a pedophile or something. And so wow. my question was more around, is there any advocacy 
do you think that's needed in round of that? Like, just the social stigma that's attacked, attached to men as the primary perpetrators and that all men must be this way. And the other example that popped into my mind was when they were pushing out gay men from the Boy Scouts of America because they were picturing them as abusers because they were gay men as well. So yeah. just that slight. Like, yeah. yeah, at least they're, they're waking up to that. So we've got a long way to go, let's face it. We've got a long way to go, and it's, it's incredibly sad that these, these uh, societal views are still prevalent with some people. Yeah. I think it's changing, but not fast enough, I'll agree. Um, you know, I, I work with victims. I, I, I know how they get hurt. I know how they get perceived. I also know how they're scared. I was just wondering if you're familiar with the uh, class action lawsuit that was successful uh, by boys that were sexually abused in a boys' reformatory in Cooper. Um, are you familiar with that and all that case? No. The, the, the most interesting thing is I rarely watch the news. Well, this was a while ago, but okay. this You know, I, I got to confess, I, 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 I hear bad stories all day long. I don't find that entertaining when I watch the news. Some people will send me articles and I'll, I'll read those, but yeah. Can you elaborate on that statement of the, uh, if you could sexually abuse, you will abuse as well? That, is it is a myth? Can you elaborate? Yeah, for like sure. A widely it's a, thing? For sure, it's like the vampire syndrome. Once you've been bit, you're going to fight. It's, it's a stupid myth and it's been debunked for like, a long, long time. It's just not true. Um, as a matter of fact, all of the men across the board that I've worked with over the past 12 years, um, they are overprotective of their children. Overprotective of their children and other people's children. One of the guys, he was at the mall, one of my clients, he was at the mall, and there was a big long lineup for the women's washing pounds. And then there was no lineup for the men's washing. And this lady came up to him and said, can you take my son into the bathroom? total stranger. He freaked. He said, I can't take your son into the bathroom. I can't do that. And every man that's been abused that I tell that story to, they go, for sure, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't. Because, you know, they, they, they can't be, they, they don't, they don't feel anybody should be safe taking a kid into the bathroom that doesn't know that child. They're overprotective. Another guy <coughs> told his, his son, his 16-year-old son, what happened to him. And the 16-year-old son said to him, that's why you'll never let me have a sleepover. He was 16. Dad would never let him out of his sight for a sleepover. Because that's what happened to him. A sleepover. Yeah. The vast majority, all the, all the men I've ever worked with across the board are overprotective of children all the time. Just going along with that, um, the myth that they will become sexually abusive to their own children. Is there any link between being abused as a child and then becoming abusive towards your wife or partner in more of a domestic abuse or like that kind of way? Yeah, the domestic abuse part, the physical violence, yeah, that happens. And I'll tell you why, because there's a lot of anger. And they, have, they don't know where the anger is coming from. So someone who's been sexually untreated sexual abuse, as I said earlier, that they people like that are, can be very angry. They can be sometimes violent. They really need to get help. Uh, you could close half the prisons if you could get them help. Yeah, there is there is the story of that. And most often, though, they will punch holes in the wall. They'll you know they'll take it out on some other thing. Um, they men who've been violated against do not violate, but hurt people hurt. So, um, when I get a lot of people who come to see me because they actually got, they, they raise their hand to their wife or their, or their husband if they're gay. And they said, you know, what is that? I, I never do stuff like that. Something's really wrong with me. That's a wake up call for them. Tough questions. Here. <laughs> Lynn, you mentioned a couple of times you, I thought you said that you could close half the prisons. Could you elaborate a bit on that? Is it because you had clients that you're working with are involved with the law? Have been through? No, no. People, by the time they come to me, they're usually 
functioning human beings who have jobs because I'm in private practice, they don't pay me. So, you know, the, the ones that can come to me, they're, they're not getting treated. And usually, they're angry, they're, or they're drug abuse and substance abuse, drugs or alcohol or some other substance to medicate, self-medicate. Where do they get the money for that? They steal, they rob, they, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things that happen there. Um, angry, somebody looks at them sideways and they just get so angry, so they, you know, they can become violent, which perfect strangers. Um, there's all of those kinds of crimes. Um, if we didn't have the, if we could find out what the underlying issue is, I will bet you more than half, like more than half the time, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's an abuse. More than half the time. Well, that's what's that the impact. I think that 50 percent. And Deborah yeah, Mate has said that um, uh, in terms of homelessness, he also believes that childhood. Yeah. Sexual abuse yeah. is responsible, and yeah. most, most homeless are men. Yeah. Sexual abuse is the major. Yeah. I went to Seaton House many years ago, and I was going to run a group for them, Seaton House, for free. Um, and they do a lot of stuff for free, like I'm doing here tonight. <laughs> so I went there at night and I said, How many people would we have in this group? And he said, 95% of the people here. Yeah, 95% of the people that were in. The next level of seat in the house where you can stay there all day long, you know, that one. Yeah. No surprise to me. This is such an epidemic and it's such an underserved population. Underserved unbelievably. So, what are we going to do? Start talking about it. Anybody that's going to do this, come forward. Let them know the numbers. <laughs> one more question? No, no. Oh, okay, one more. I'm sorry. So, if eight or ten uh, no sexual abuse cases are perpetrated <coughs> by men on men, um, is there any research into uh, why kind of it's happening? I mean, like, it could be just, you know, if they have like sexual attraction to children or abuse like that, but also is it like a, is that culturally driven as well? Does anyone research into that or that you're aware of? I don't know about research, but I can tell you anecdotally, it seems to me anecdotally that it's a power thing. And I guess maybe the evidence to that is what's going on in the military. It's a power thing. So it's not so much that they're sexually attracted to children, although often that's the case if the, if the, if the victim is young. But I think anecdotally that it seems to be the person was getting even with them, or you know, when they say armies going to rape and plunder, they always assume it's women and children that are getting raped. That's actually not true. Actually, the men are getting raped, and the men are getting raped because that that makes them fall. That makes them look weak and you know, a woman. Um, so. Even, here's another interesting thing that I found out when I was looking at them, that stuff. If you, if somebody broke into your house and start, stole things from you, um, and you caught them, and they raped you, you would be called the police. Mm. Weird, but true. Thank you. For the Canadian Center for Men and Families. Uh, I'll be really quick, everyone. Just one minute, everyone's uh, rushing to leave. So, uh, at the Canadian Center for Men and Families, we do have uh, research groups, and uh, we like to look into issues that are um, related to men. So, actually, before this event, I was doing a project on um, sexual abuse against um, sexual abuse on young male children, and um, she did bring it up with the homelessness. Most of it involved youth are sexual abuse, both um, boys and girls. As well, and uh, I looked into juvenile um, juvenile prison as well, and the statistics there were actually horrifying as well. Um, up to 10% of kids in juvenile prison, which are 90% male by the way, are sexually abused, and 95% of the time, those abusers are women. So these are just some of the things I, I had seen, and um, we're, we were very fortunate to have Lynn here, and I thank her for all of her work. And um, it's, so 
the point I'm trying to make is we need volunteers to help us with this research. It's not just boys' issues. It could also be uh, men's issues. It can be um, legal, anything like that. You don't have to be a scholar. You just need to um, be, good at, be good at looking stuff online, look at studies, and maybe help out with that. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Regarding um, if you uh, research, if you're interested in doing that for the Canadian Center for Men and Families. So uh, I'd like to conclude tonight's talk now and thank Lynn McDonald for your. No, McDonnell. McDonnell. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to thank you, Lynn McDonnell, for speaking tonight and for being here for the UT Men's Issues Awareness Society and um, bringing light to the, to the issues that are um, significant for. for um, for the discussion. And uh, thank you also for coming tonight. And um, if this is your first U of T Men's Issues Awareness event, I'd like to invite you to sign up for further email updates and notifications of our, of our events um, with me or um, with reception on Thank you so much for coming out tonight. <coughs>